Hi everyone, it's Mr. Vallejo. Today we'll be taking a look at cell structure and function. Uh, let's take a look at the PowerPoint for today. And here we go. Okay. Remember you have access to this in Canvas. So if you would like to take a look at that, you certainly are welcome to do that. That way you can go at your own pace. So structure and function. Um, this is one of those organizing principles in biology. <clears throat> we say that the cell is a basic, uh, basic unit of life. Um, we uh, need to qualify that and say that it's a basic structural unit of life and the basic functional unit of life. That means all of the uh, all of the living organisms that you can possibly see are made up structurally of cells. Every living thing is made of cells. And the functions that living things go through in the metabolism, um, those are all a result of cellular functions. So the cell is a basic unit of life. It's a basic structural and functional unit of life. Um, all cells are alike, uh, alike, that is that they, they have a plasma membrane, they have a DNA containing region and a cytoplasm. Now the plasma membrane is the outside of the cell. It's oftentimes called the, the cell membrane and it forms the boundaries of the cells, um, whether those cells live inside another organism or if they, live freely in the environment, it forms the boundaries of those cells. The third comment there says membranes in general, um, not the plasma membrane per se, but the uh, but membranes in general compartmentalize the interior of the cell and facilitate a variety of metabolic activities in organisms that we call eukaryotic organisms. So what's going to happen is that these structures that are inside of cells are made up of membranes. Second of all, uh, living things have a DNA containing region, a part where they store and transfer genetic information. If you remember from previous talks and readings, uh, DNA is the, uh, is the information, the genetic, the genetic blueprint for living things. All of the information that we would need to, to be a human are locked up in our 46 chromosomes of, of DNA. Uh, there are 25,000 to 30,000 different genes um, that uh, make up a human. And so all of that information is in the DNA. Uh, different amounts for different organisms, but for us, for humans, 46 chromosomes, 30,000 30, genes. And the cytoplasm, we used to think was called the uh, it's the liquid portion of the cell. We know now that there's a, a lot more structure <clears throat> to the cytoplasm. And so we'll study that a little bit as we take a look at the structure of the cell. There are two different types of cells. There's eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic, prokaryotic cells. There's a, some definitions from the dictionary, but for EU, that basically means true. So when we say eukaryotic, we mean true nucleus, karyo means a nucleus. So those organisms that have cells that have a true nucleus, those are what we call eukaryotic cells. Those include animals, plants, fungi, protists, all of these are eukaryotic cells. The prokaryotic cells, um, pro means before, karyo means the nucleus. If we look at evolution, um, and if we, we subscribe to that, then we would say that the uh, prokaryotic cells came before the establishment of the nucleus. Those are bacteria. <clears throat> and the bacteria are going to be um, called the prokaryotic uh, cells. And prokaryotes is a term that I use interchangeably with bacteria. So we're going to take uh, a look at eukaryotic cells for the most part today. Uh, we're going to take a look in the second half at structures that are found in plants and animals. But remember, the eukaryotic cells are the true nucleated cells, and they have uh, 
uh, many different structures inside them. Uh, they are compartmentalized into uh, different structures with different functions. And this makes eukaryotic cells much more complex and much more complicated than prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are, on the other hand, uh, more simple. They're generally smaller. They don't have a nucleus, although they do have a region of DNA uh, where the DNA clumps up. But that DNA is not in a membrane-bound structure. You can see another diagram that shows us that. There's that DNA in this drawing. Uh, it's together, but it's, again, it's not in a membrane-bound structure. These cells are gonna be quite small. And uh, as you can see from the scale here, most plant and animal cells are in this range here from 10 to 100 microns. That's 10 to negative six uh, meters. They're really small. Um, we can see that with a light microscope. You can see with this arrow right here. Um, but these are too small to see without the microscope. Here's the range of the unaided eye. So cells are very small, microscopic, very in size and shape. Um, but they never get really large. And uh, here's a, a, a graphic which shows you Mothra. If you remember the classic sci-fi movie, Mothra versus Godzilla or Godzilla versus Mothra. Uh, you might remember that Mothra was angry and flapped her wings and, and buildings in that um, mock-up of, of Tokyo just blew right over. But what made Mothra so, so angry? Well, the scientists took a large, large oval shaped object as large as a huge building, as big as your Costco maybe. And, uh, and put that in an airplane hangar and we're doing experiments on it. Well, Mothra was missing an egg. So the scientists were messing with Mothra's eggs. And uh, so that's why Mothra was angry. But this is why it's also science fiction is you would never have an egg that big. And we'll see why mathematically that's true after we take a look at these guys. Here's some important people as we establish what's called the cell theory. Um, cell theory uh, is, uh, is something that keeps us in line. Uh, it says that the uh, cell is the basic uh, unit of life. We know it's the basic structural and functional unit of life. We also know that all cells come from cells uh, and that there's uh, not a spontaneous generation of cells, all cells come from other cells. And, uh, and so we'll take a look at the establishment of this idea as we take a look at these five cytologists. First, there's Robert Hooke. Robert Hooke gets credit for coining the term the cell. He thought that it looked a lot like those little rooms where the monks live in the monastery, which are called cells. Next, we have the Dutch lens maker, von Leeuwenhoek. And von Leeuwenhoek developed the microscope uh, he gets credit for what they call animalcules. Uh, what he uh, thought was happening was that when you look at sperm under the microscope, he thought there was a little man inside the head, and that little man popped out uh, in, in, into the egg, and that's how we got people. Well, not quite right, but uh, he was able to demonstrate that he could see really small things with the microscope that he developed while he worked as a lens maker. Schleiden came up with this idea that plant cells uh, come from other plant cells. So the chia plants on this guy's head come from other plants. And animal cells come from animal cells. I really don't remember why I selected these graphics, but they are really cute. Uh, Schwann was a famous scientist of, of, of his own recognition in his own day. Um, and he came up with this idea, animal cells come from animal cells. About a year after Schleiden came up with the idea, plant cells come from plant cells. And finally, Rudy Virchow, a uh, Italian scientist, came up and, and put it all together. He said, all cells come from cells. Seems pretty easy, seems pretty simple, but this is now known as the Virchow principle, all cells come from other cells. Now earlier I mentioned that uh, 
have mathematically, we can see why cells never get as big as Mothra's egg. Well, what it is here is here is a, here's one large cube with a surface area of 30 microns and uh, on each of the six face and each of the three dimensions, you have uh, 30 microns. Here it's only 10, but to take up the same volume, you would need 27 of these cubes. Now, if you take a look at it, what it means then is that if these, this large cell is gonna die from the inside out, it won't have enough surface area, and then it won't have enough spaces for the oxygen to go in and the waste products go out to food, for food to go in at the center of the cell. doesn't have, it's too big. If, if you were trying to get food into the middle of this, this, uh, these little 27 small cubes here, then you would have a much easier time. But the surface to volume ratio is favorable for smaller objects. Another way we say that is uh, mathematically, is that if you take a look over here at the, the area uh, right there, this has a much greater area, 27 small cubes, than in one large cube. So to, to, they have the same exact volume, but this one has a much greater uh, surface area, so there are more surfaces for the uh, diffusion of of gases and the uh, and the uh, entrance of food into uh, that area. All right. In this second half, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some structures that are important in plants and animal cells. A plant cell has some structures that an animal cell lacks. The one you probably think of first is the chloroplast. Chloroplasts have pigments in them. Um, the main pigment is chlorophyll, and chlorophyll is, uh, uh, reflects red and a blue light, but it uh, absorbs a green light. So this is why plants look green, because they have chlorophyll, and because that chlorophyll is in their chloroplasts. Plant cells also have a, a rigid cell wall made up of cellulose. We learned about cellulose in a previous lecture. Um, the rigid cell wall is what holds these plant cells up. Animal cells, they don't, they don't have cell walls. So we have a, uh, we as vertebrates have skeletons to hold us up. Plants don't need this. Plants just have a cell wall and the, the pressure inside of the, of the plant cell is going to push on the inside of the cell wall, and we'll see that that is going to have uh, some physiological repercussions in the plant, and we'll study those in a future lecture. And then we have a large central vacuole, right? Here is the nucleus, but this one right here, that's a large storage center right there that you have in plant cells. Typically, the nucleus is the largest of those little structures called organelle, um, little organs, but the uh, but the central in plants is oftentimes much bigger than the nucleus. Now, animal cells also have structures that plant cells don't have. First of all, they have what are called centrioles. In the picture right here, it's yellow. These centrioles are involved in, in cell reproduction, and we'll study those uh, in the future as we take a look at mitosis and meiosis. Um, animal cells also may have a flagellum, which allows them to move whether inside a body or uh, outside of an organism. And then uh, animal cells, because they more are associated with movement, these little bean-shaped structures here called mitochondria. And mitochondria are known as the powerhouse of the cell. So animal cells have more mitochondria. Now we're gonna take a look at the cell parts from the inside out. This is the nucleus. The nucleus is the cellular control center. Some people call it the brain of the cell, but this is where all the genetic information is in the form of, of the uh, chromosomes uh, when the chromatin is condensed. But the nucleus has these items in it. So let's take a look at each of those. First of all, you have the nuclear envelope, which is a like the nuclear membrane, but it's actually a double membrane. So it's really important to keep the DNA safe and locked up and uh, inside of the nucleus in order to get the message out. What we're gonna have to do is copy the message on the DNA to the messenger RNA. Uh, and that is uh, the theme of, of biochemistry. But 
uh, to, to protect that DNA, we have not just a single membrane, but a double membrane. So the nuclear envelope separates the nucleus from the cytoplasm. It regulates what leaves the nucleus also, and that's important. When we take a look at uh, the process of transcription, uh, the process where proteins are made, uh, proteins are made when the DNA is read and the message is copied and can go out of these pores that are on the nuclear envelope. Inside the nucleus, sometimes in, if you look at this under a microscope, you see a darker section. That darker section called the nucleolus. The nucleus is the site of ribosome synthesis. Learn a little bit that ribosomes are uh, structures that make protein. And then we have inside the nucleus, we have the chromosomes. The chromosomes uh, are made up of chromatin. Uh, the DNA is basically wrapped around these proteins and uh, the, uh, that, that structure in most of the, during most of the cell cycle is called chromatin. But during, during cell division, uh, during the um, uh, process of mitosis and meiosis, what happens is that chromatin will get thicker and condense and we'll see it as what we call a chromosome. Human chromosomes are typically X-shaped. Um, and so the, those, uh, that chromatin, that genetic or the chemical material then uh, becomes so, so thick and twisted up uh, that we can actually see it under the microscope when the cell is about ready to divide. Now many organelles are connected in um, the cytomembrane system. That's the structures from, from the nucleus going outwards. So let's continue our search and our study of those objects. We have the endoplasmic reticulum or the ER. There's two different varieties. There's the rough ER and the smooth ER. The rough ER makes membranes and proteins. Um, and this, uh, you see in this picture right here, the rough ER is called the rough ER because under the microscope, you have all these little dots, which are the ribosomes, and these ribosomes are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. So um, what happens is the the ribosomes that are on the proteins, uh, the ribosomes that are on the, on the rough ER are going to make proteins, and then the uh, proteins will make their, own, their way out of the cell, which makes those proteins secretory enzymes. Uh, they're chemicals that are going to be secreted and used in another part of the body. The smooth ER um, has a bunch of different functions, but the most important one is the process of intracellular transport. That is transport within the cell. Um, I know in, uh, where, where I live, there's a freeway that goes right through, but my, uh, my hometown is a, is a really skinny city. And, and so uh, if you need to go from one end to the other, taking si instead of taking side streets, you might take the freeway. And sometimes you might just go two or three exits down, but going 65, two, three exits down, it's a lot faster than hitting five uh, stoplights on, on the side street. So sometimes it's more, uh, it's quicker to go on the freeway and sometimes it's quicker to go through the smooth ER if you're going within the cell, you're moving from one part of the cell to the other. So that's the job of the smooth ER. Um, the Golgi bodies, what they do is they take those proteins that are made in the rough ER, and they, uh, uh, those proteins are, are packaged. So there's a lot of text in this slide, but the most important word that you have here is uh, packages. So the Golgi bodies, or sometimes called the Golgi apparatus, are going to package up those proteins into, on this picture, these little structures right there. This is the Golgi body. And the Golgi body is, uh, is uh, some people liken this to, to pancakes. And I think, I say it's more like waffles. Because when I make waffles, I'm a little sloppy. And I, I pour the, the waffle material, the crusties, into the waffle maker. And when I push down the waffle maker, um, close the lid, sometimes little pieces of, of, uh, of the, the crusties that, uh, will will come out, and uh, those are are analogous to these little stretchers here. These vesicles that are popping out. Um, these vesicles would contain the proteins and then move to the cell membrane. Uh, here, 
there, there are different uh, types of vesicles and specific types of vesicles. One's called a lysosome. And a lysosome is a, a vesicle that has enzymes that are used to break down things. So it says here, sacs of breakdown enzymes that function in a digestion uh, within a cell. So these lysozymes are going to destroy bacteria, recycle damaged organelle. You'll see in this picture right here, here is a photo of some lysozymes that are being, uh, are, that, are, that are destroying the bacteria that shouldn't be there. And here's some lysosomes. Here's one in particular. Um, this is one large lysosome that has in it a peroxisome, which is uh, harmful to the body. And then here's a mitochondrion that may not be working. So it says it's a fragment, but then the, the uh, cell can recycle those parts, use them over again. Um, another type of vesicle is a, a peroxisome, and a peroxisome would help to get rid of the peroxide chemical which is another dangerous chemical that builds up in our bodies. Another structure is called the mitochondria, and I have to say as a biology teacher, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. What the mitochondria do is they harvest chemical energy from the food, and we're going to take a look at the whole process of cellular respiration in a future talk, but these are the chemical reactions that happen to food and we're gonna take a look at your basic food molecule, which is glucose. And we're gonna take that glucose and see how those chemical reactions go about to make a bunch of uh, energy molecules. Those energy molecules are called ATP. So um, we're going to see that one glucose molecule is gonna result in the production of 36 ATP molecules. There are also structures called plastids. Plastids are structures that are associated with color in, in, um, in cells. The one I want you to know is the chlor uh, chloroplast. There are others, there's the chromoplast and amyloplast. And if you're interested in those, I'll, I'll uh, allow you to uh, do some internet searching. But the chloroplasts what, are the ones that make your plant screen. And the chloroplasts have, have the chlorophyll, and the chlorophyll is a pigment that absorbs the light energy or the solar energy and makes that conversion to chemical energy. Now in the picture down here, you'll see the little stacks of the green structures right there. Those green structures are called thylakoids and photosynthesis actually takes place at the site of the um, thylakoid membrane. So you have these stacks of thylakoids and these stacks of thylakoids are called grana. One is called a granum and they are in an in a soupy mixture called the stroma. The grana and stroma both have proteins dissolved in them, and these proteins are necessary for photosynthesis. <clears throat> Another structure you'll see is the vacuole. The vacuole is necessary for storage. Because your plant cells contain a large central vacuole, which has lysosomal and storage functions. So a lot of text, but really what you need to know about the vacuole, it's for storage. And a plant might store water, it might store water with minerals in it. It might store uh, uh, a liquid with, with uh, sugars, food molecules that are, um, that are stuck in there. So um, we have the vacuum is for storage. Uh, this is in animals. Um, some protists have, uh, that's why a protist is, a, is, is an animal-like unicellular structure. But um, in animal-like structures, you also see some of these uh, vacuoles, and this is used to pump out extra water here. These are contractile vacuoles that are seen in these structures called paramecia. And then we also have, uh, the, if you recall from the very beginning of this talk, I was saying that the, the cytoplasm is like the liquid portion of the cell. And it's not really liquid, um, it's not just random. Um, it has structure to it, and inside the structure, you have the cytoskeleton. And the cytoskeleton is an, is an internal structure, and there are three different types uh, of, of fibers that are classified according to their size. You can see here the microfilament is a seven nanometers. The microtubule is 25 nanometers or so. A nanometer, by the way, is um, 10 to the negative ninth 
of a meter. Um, so that's a billionth of a meter. And then in between in size, the microfilament and the microtubule, you have the intermediate filaments. So here's some important information that you might uh, need to know about microtubules, microfilaments, and, and intermediate filaments. Um, the microtubules are necessary for um, providing anchors for organelle, especially in um, the process of mitosis, mitosis, which is animal cell reproduction. So microtubules, those are the thickest ones, also give the cytoplasm that rigidity. And uh, when organelle move uh, throughout, the, uh, uh, throughout the cell, if they're not moving on that, that smooth ER, they do still move along uh, these tracks uh, that are provided by the microtubules. It's analogous to uh, a highway and, uh, and the endoplasmic, uh, the ER, the smooth ER being the highway and the side streets being these microtubules. So you have the microtubules, you have the uh, microfilaments, which are important in movement. Uh, you have the uh, microfilament called actin, which is necessary in muscle movement uh, in conjunction with another um, chemical called myosin. We'll see that later in the class. And then finally, you have intermediate filaments. Intermediate filaments says reinforce the cell and anchor cell organelle. All right, so here's a, a slide specifically on microfilaments, and we've already covered that material. Here's the same uh, graphic, but uh, uh, information on the uh, intermediate filaments. Now, um, and, uh, one of the final structures we need to take a look at have to do with the animal cells, and animal cells have, uh, have flagella I mentioned earlier. Uh, cilia, cilia and flagella move when microtubules bend. Uh, in this picture here, you have a single flagellum. You might have a couple in different, uh, different situations. Here you have many, many hair-like structures. These are called cilia. They might uh, line the tract of your respiratory system, for example. But whenever there's, there's movement to be had, uh, flagella and cilia uh, are, are parts of the cell that are involved in, in movement. So these are some structures um, that are found in animals and plant cells that are important for us to take a look at. Um, and to help you learn that, uh, I have created a Quizlet set that I'd like you to go over. So take a look at the link in Canvas to the Quizlet set. Essentially, you'll be learning the structure and the function of all these different things that I've briefly gone over today. If you know the structure, you should know the function. If someone were to tell you the function, you should know what structure is able to do that. So take a look at that Quizlet set, set as part of your lab exercises for this week. And, and that's it. That is uh, the cell, that structure and function of the cell. I'm Mr. Vallejo. Thanks for coming today.